I'm Professor Chris French. I'm head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit here at Goldsmiths. And the first question that that usually prompts is, what the hell is anomalistic psychology? Now, I could give you a nice, wordy, formal definition, but I find it kind of gets to the point much quicker if I just say to people, it's the psychology of weird shit. Okay, so it's everything from alien abductions to zombies and lots of weird <coughs> stuff in between. I'm interested in what is the psychology behind these kinds of beliefs and the kind of weird experiences that everybody has. I'm interested in all of these kinds of things. I used to believe in a lot of this stuff myself when I was younger, but uh, the more I've learned about the way the mind works, the, may I, the way that our minds can actually play tricks on us, the more sceptical I have become. Um, Anomalistic psychology essentially is about trying to come up with non-paranormal explanations for ostensibly paranormal experiences. Now I think whether you're a believer in the paranormal or whether you're a sceptic, you probably find these kind of things quite interesting and fun and fascinating, but generally I think people don't think this has got much relevance to everyday real life. Uh, situations. And I want to argue against that. I want to say that actually understanding aspects of anomalistic psychology often does have very direct implications for understanding controversial claims in other areas of life that you might not consider to have anything to do with the paranormal. So, next slide please. Here's one example. <clears throat> this lady here is Rosemary Crossley, uh, an Australian teacher who back in the 1970s uh, proposed a technique to try to help children and adults with severe communication problems. They couldn't speak, they often couldn't communicate in any way at all. And what she proposed, this very simple idea, was that if a third party actually, uh, next slide please, actually held their arm, as you can see in the picture there, just enough to kind of steady the tremor, they could actually use keyboards, and they could actually communicate with the world. And this was called facilitated communication. The person holding the arm was called the facilitator. And this seemed to be a major breakthrough. Basically, the, um, the, the kids, and sometimes adults, could suddenly communicate with the outside world. Sometimes they were producing kind of poetry, even writing novels. It was fantastic. The problem was that it appeared to some people to be actually too good to be true. The situation was that sometimes, I mean in most of these cases, the kids hadn't even had any training in, in written communication. And sometimes when they were using these keyboards, they weren't even looking at the keyboards, they were staring off into space. And so there were, there were doubters from the word go. So that's facilitated communication. What's that got to do with the paranormal weird stuff? Next slide, please. This is the man Douglas Bicklin, who introduced facilitated communication into America, and from there it spread around the world. And obviously, you can imagine the effect this had on the parents of those kids. They, it was, you know, they, they, they really thought this was an amazing, amazing breakthrough. Okay, next slide, please. It's something completely different. What's this? This is the ADE 651 bomb detector. This it was a, a, a Newsnight program uh, back in 2010, I believe it was, uh, where they did an expose of this particular device. It was being used, it was a, made by a British company, and it was being used to detect explosives. It was essentially a, a metal rod that swivels in a handheld grip, and it was said to be based upon the same principles that underlie dousing. Dousing is a technique, I'll say a lot more about it in a second, that can be used, it is claimed, and for centuries it has been claimed, to locate water and for various other purposes. And this was said to be based on the same principles. This amazing device, the Iraqi government spent $85 million on, that's £52 million, pounds, and each of these kits cost $40,000. And they were being used in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in various trouble spots around the world by security forces. It was said that this amazing device had even more astonishing powers. By simply changing a card in the device, you could use it to 
to detect um, not only explosives, but also people, elephants, and hundred dollar bills. And it was said to be able to detect explosives up to a range of one kilometer. So this is pretty miraculous. Now what were those two different claims? Facilitated communication and these bomb detectors. What do they have in common, apart from the fact that they both appear to be kind of near miraculous? Well, the answer lies in anonymous psychology. They both explained in terms of why they might appear to work by something called the idiomotor effect. As it says there, it's the phenomenon whereby unconscious muscular activity causes movement which is then mistakenly attributed to an external source. And why this is important within anomalistic psychology is because it explains a lot of seemingly paranormal phenomena. So, next slide please. Back in the Victorian heyday of seances, a craze which started in America and then spread over to the UK and to Europe more generally was called table tilting. And what this would involve would be using a small round wooden table, people would put their hands on the table and they would try and communicate with the spirits. And in a good session, the, 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 the table might jerk slightly in response to questions, and then it would build up. And on a really good session, you'd end up with a situation where people were chasing the table around, trying to keep in contact with it as it raced around the room. Amazing. And everybody believed that these movements were caused by spirits. This has got a special place in the history of anomalistic psychology because, next slide please, it attracted the attention of the great English physicist, Michael Faraday. He wanted to know what the heck was going on. There were two possibilities. One, that the table was being moved by some external force, possibly spirits. Or two, that people were actually moving the table themselves, but were not consciously aware of it. Suffice it to say that he carried out a series of really ingenious experiments that showed that people were moving the table themselves. Um, <coughs> okay, next slide please. The idiomotor effect also explains what happens when people use Ouija boards. Uh, in case you don't know, I'm sure you probably do, Ouija boards have the letters of the alphabet, they have the words yes and no typically, digits from, one to, from uh, zero to nine, and usually sign of hello and goodbye on there. Um, and this thing in the middle there, that's called a planchette, it's a kind of half shaped wooden platform that, that can, people put their fingers on it, they ask questions, and amazingly, the planchette will move around to different letters and spell out responses. And people believe this is spirits that are causing the, causing the movement. If you can't afford posh version, the student version is an upturned wine glass and just bits of paper with the letters on. It still works just as well as I can testify from personal experience. Many a drunken Friday night as a student, coming home from the pub and having a Ouija session. All very entertaining. Again, basically what's going on here is down to the idiomotor effect. But I can vouch for the fact that the illusion that the glass or the planchette is moving by itself is very, very strong. Of course, if everybody takes their finger off, it stops. And if you ever try having a Ouija session where you blindfold the participants and turn the board around, you won't get any sensible out of it. But as long as you can see it, and you've all got your finger on, you get the impression that the movement is coming from somewhere else. But it's the idiomotor effect. Another way to communicate with the spirits, if you don't have enough already, is automatic writing. Again, it's based on the idiomotor effect, but this time you hold a pen or paper lightly above the paper, you go into a trance state, and allegedly a spirit will take over your body, and you'll channel the spirit, and you will write things without realising what you're writing until you come out of the trance and look at the paper. One very famous case of this is uh, this lady here, Eleanor yeah. Smith, with Theodore Flournoy, he's a psychologist. This was back at the beginning of the last century, and Helen, actually she wasn't communicating with spirits, she was communicating with Martians, okay? And she even had a Martian alphabet. Now, fortunately, it turned out that the Martian language was very similar to French, which was her native language, which must have been quite helpful, obviously. Um, Flournoy, not surprisingly, concluded that the messages were not coming from Mars, they were coming from Helen's subconscious mind. Okay, next slide, please. 
Dowsing I've already mentioned. Dowsing is a centuries old practice whereby it's said that using uh, Y-shaped uh, twigs like this, you can locate water. Basically, the dowser would walk over the area where they're looking for water, and at a certain point, the, uh, the, the branch would appear to point downwards, that's where the water source is. If you try it in the UK, you are guaranteed to be successful, because it doesn't matter where you dig down in the UK, you're bound to come to the water, because the water table is underneath everywhere in the UK. Um, but this is used in other area parts of the world where water might be in short supply. There are other dousing tools that can be used. Sometimes people use these L-shaped rods and they walk around and then eventually, when you're over the water, the rods would cross. Or they might use pendulums. In all of these situations, you're using a system where a very slight movement on your part produces a big effect. Uh, next slide, please. People go even further. As I say, in terms of the possible uses for dousing, I just step through these. Locating water, some people say you can also locate ore deposits, find lost landmarks, find buried treasure, trace lost animals, diagnose illnesses, determine the sex of unborn children. A lot of people believe you hold a pendulum over a pregnant woman's belly, the way it rotates tells you whether it's male or female, and you will be right 50% of the time. Next one, assessing the status of crop circles, are they genuinely produced by aliens, or are they those nasty hoaxes? Spoiler, it's always those nasty hoaxes. <laughs> or obviously, you can communicate with spirits. Um, and one really interesting idea, next slide. You don't even have to be at the location of the target object. You can actually just use a map and get your pendulum out, and you can find the missing body or the treasure or whatever it is you're looking for, just by moving your pendulum over the map until it responds. It's all nonsense, it's all the idea of motor effect. Double blind studies repeatedly show that dousing does not work if the dowser either doesn't know where the target object is or, and there's no cues there that would help them to guess it. Now, um, you've probably guessed what the Newsnight expose found. Because those devices, the, the so-called bomb detectors, were based on the same principles as dousing, it was as effective as dousing, i.e. they weren't effective at all. And the tragedy here, of course, is that probably hundreds of people lost their lives. Those devices were still being used in Iraq up to 2016. They don't work. They never worked. They've never been shown to work to, to locate explosives, let alone elephants. Um, fortunately, in 2013, Jim McCormack, the guy who produced those devices was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, and he really, if anyone deserved it, he really did. He knew they didn't work and he just didn't care. When one of his workers had challenged him by saying, you know, do these things really work? He says, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. They make money. That was all he was interested in. With the facilitated communication, it doesn't work. Properly controlled double blind tests were done, many of them, that show that if the, if the child knows the answer, knows what the target object is, but the facilitator doesn't, then you don't get an answer. If the facilitator knows what the answer is and thinks the child knows, then you get the answer, even if the child in fact hasn't been shown the answer. So we know that what's happening there is the idiomotor effect again. Those Facilitators who genuinely believed they were helping these kids were actually using them as human Ouija boards. And that's tragic. That is absolutely tragic. It would be tragic enough if it was just a case of raising false hope on the part of those poor, desperate parents. But there are over a dozen cases of alleged sexual abuse that were made on the basis of this technique that just does not work. And facilitator communication is still going on today. Now, I can't resist at this point just giving you one more history, really interesting historical case that seems to combine aspects of both automatic writing and facilitated communication. This guy is Frederick Bly Bond, or he was, uh, more commonly known as Bly Bond. He was an architect and a psychical researcher. So I said architect there, I meant archaeologist, forgive me. He was an archaeologist and a psychical researcher. 
and he was responsible for the excavation of Glastonbury Abbey. And in 1919, after the excavation had been done, he wrote a book called The Gates of Remembrance, where he revealed to the world that the excavation had been helped by advice from the spirit world. He had got together with John Allen Bartlett, who was a, a medium uh, known as John Elaine, and together, he claimed, they had communicated with the spirits of dead monks and people who'd helped to build the original abbey, and that's where they knew how they knew where to dig. Now, interestingly, when both of them had tried on their own to do automatic writing, they hadn't got very good results. But they found that if Bond put his hands on Bartlett's hands, then the messages <coughs> flowed through. And they believed the messages were coming from the spirit world. In actual fact, the messages were almost certainly based on the fact that they did intensive research before they started any of this psychic nonsense. They read as much as they could about the sides, and they just used reasonable conjecture to actually come up with these answers. But he sincerely believed that that's where the information had come from. Um, now, this, that's just two examples, facilitated communication and uh, the bomb detectors, where knowing about something from anomalistic psychology, knowing about the idiomotor effect, could have averted tragedy. But there are other examples as well. So, just to give you one other example very quickly, um, there have been hundreds, if probably thousands in fact, of cases where people have alleged that they were sexually abused as children on the basis of memories recovered during very dubious forms of psychotherapy. And that's the only evidence that they had. They couldn't remember it and then suddenly they could after the therapy. The question is, of course, are those true memories or are they false memories? I would argue very strongly that they're false memories. And one of the big reasons for that is that exactly the same techniques are used, whether you're talking about this situation of somebody with a therapist or next, people recovering memories of being abducted by aliens or recovering memories of being Mary Queen of Scots in a past life. It's exactly the same techniques that are being used. So if you're not prepared to accept these, logically you probably shouldn't accept that either without any supporting independent evidence. So hopefully I've convinced you that although, you know, the, I mean I do find the topics these weird topics fascinating in and of themselves, that by taking weird shit seriously, we can actually learn things of relevance for the real world. So thank you very much for listening.